name's Eric Chabot. I'm the director of Ratio Christi, the apologetics ministry here at Ohio State. Some of you are familiar with us, but if you're not uh, familiar with us, we are a apologetics ministry on the campus. There's a table in the back with some info about us that you can uh, check us out at the end of the event, uh, sign up sheet. But yes, we do meet on the campus. We have meetings every Tuesday night, Central Classroom, Room 211. So we are here, and some of you have been to our other events. We've had William Lane Craig and Oh, Frank Turek and a debate with Bart Ehrman and Michael Brown and some other things. So anyway, appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, just a little bit, uh, I want to mention one thing about our books tonight. We will be selling some books in the back. And if this kind of material whets your appetite a little bit, stop back, uh, come in the back, and I will show you what books we have to uh, sell tonight. And we have some very technical ones and some basic introductory ones, but I will be giving this brochure away. It's a little Rose Publishing thing, kind of unfolds like this. A lot of information on the topic tonight, and I have a bunch of those for uh, free there on the back table if you want to stop by and get one. I can't give one. I don't have like 100 of them, but I have some of them, so stop by. You can get one when we're done. But uh, I'm really excited to have our speaker here tonight. And this is the first time we've done this topic, so it's, it's, uh, it's a new one for us. So we're very excited to have our speaker, who is Dr. Paul Nelson. Uh, Dr. Nelson just spoke at our Wright State chapter last night on the same topic, and I heard it went real well. Uh, Dr. Nelson has his Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Chicago, and uh, the focus of his doctoral work was on evolutionary theory. So his specialty really is philosophy of biology. Uh, he certainly, that is his area of biology, and... Uh, He's going to talk a lot about that tonight, so I won't uh, take much longer. Now, when we are done, uh, when Dr. Nelson is done lecturing, you can come up and ask questions. I'm going to have the mic right here, and you're going to be able to come up and stand in line and ask him any questions you have. I just ask that you're courteous to everybody else and you know, make sure you give people enough time, uh, but Dr. Nelson certainly looks forward to answering some of your questions, so that's what we'll do as soon as the lecture concludes. So having said that, why don't we go ahead and give a warm welcome to Dr. Paul Nelson. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I know I shouldn't start with a shameless uh, plea for sympathy, but I'm here actually under significant personal duress. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but my wife uh, grew up north of here. You know, you know the name of the town. Her father was a professor of medicine at a little school in a little town called Ann Arbor. and. Um, her red blood cells, and they are red, are all tattooed blue. Uh, so when she heard I was going to be here, she was not happy. Um, but this is a beautiful campus. Before uh, the event tonight, I walked around a little bit. I was here years ago for a conference, and I forgot just how lovely this campus is. But you didn't hear me say that, and please don't tell her. All right, understanding intelligent design. Now, uh, as with many topics that have deep personal connections, this is a topic that inspires a lot of heat. Uh, and for that reason, it can get rather warm in a room like this as the discussion goes on. So I hope we'll try in our interactions tonight to shed as much light as we do heat. But let me tell you the fun part of the night for me, and that's the Q&A. Because I know what I'm going to say, right? I've, I've been through these slides. I know what I'm going to say. What I don't know is what you're going to say and how you're going to react to the material. So I'm going to try to get through my prepared remarks as quickly as I can so that we'll have plenty of time for interaction, uh, which, as I said, is the fun part of the night for someone like me. All right, there's a can of soup. And it's got a familiar label. And I'm sure for many of you, intelligent design is that. In fact, you'd say, look, it's just, it's just relabeling something that we knew about a long time ago to improve its marketability. But really, it's the same old soup when you take the lid off and put it in a pot, you know, it, it amounts to creationism. So my first goal tonight is to show you that intelligent design actually doesn't, when you first grasp the idea, have anything to do at all with theology. In fact, it's something, something that you do every day. If you took the trouble to stop and think about how you negotiate your day as a rational human being, you use the concept of design all the time. And I'll give you some examples of this, just to kind of prime the pump and get your intuitions going. Here's the first one. This is a real story. 
This is Robert Clark Ridge, and he's being arrested in Morro Bay, California in 1979 by plainclothes California State Police. Now, that's his legal name, but he was also known by this moniker, Mincelli Ridge. And the reason for that name should be clear to you in just a moment. All right, now, thought experiment. And again, this is a real story, but you need to sort of fit yourself into the account. Let's say you're the manager of a Denny's or you know, Big Boy, some restaurant like that, sitting in your office, and one day someone comes in, one of your employees, and they, they say, there's a guy on the men's room floor, and he's bleeding rather badly. So you go in there, and sure enough, there he is. He's bleeding badly, lying on the floor, and he says, I slipped on some jelly. You know those little packets that you get at Denny's? And it's a mess. There's blood everywhere, and he's going to sue, threatens to sue. But then he says, look, why don't you just give me $500 cash or a check for $500? I'll sign something. We'll call it even. And you think, now, this is the information you have, what I've just described. And you think, as the manager, if we go to court, we stand to lose a lot more than $500. I'm just going to make an immediate cash settlement with this guy, send him on his way, and we'll avoid litigation. Now, if that's all the information you had as the manager, you might well give him the money. But an insurance company would not because of this little detail. Insurance companies discovered soon after they were formed that if they wanted to keep in the bank what they had there, namely cash, they needed to pool information with other insurance companies about the claims that they had paid because it's in getting a large sample of claims that you can detect anomalous patterns like this one. Now, this is taken from an account that went through the career of Robert Clark Ridge. All right, so you're the manager at this restaurant, okay? Let's say it's in Denver. Then in Tucson, same guy, same flavor of jelly. Now, no one in this room is going to let this pattern go as just unremarkable or write it off to chance because these events have independent probabilities. And one of the rules of probability theory is when you have independent events, you put a multiplication sign between them to get the joint probability of both events. There's a scene in the movie Casino, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen, where Robert De Niro is chewing out the manager of the slot machines. And on that day, three of the large machines, $15,000 jackpots, hit at the same time. And De Niro, and I have to leave the F-bombs out of the account, he says to the manager, don't you realize that this cannot happen unless someone cheated? One machine, maybe. Two machines, never, because those probabilities are independent. And three machines, you know it's, it's cheating. So different restaurant in the western United States, same guy, same favor of jelly, cash exchanging hands. When you see this pattern, and again, it doesn't matter what else you believe about the world. If you're a theist, agnostic, atheist, Buddhist, skeptic, it doesn't matter. No one is going to let him get away with it and, you know, give him any more money. Mint Jelly was not out to get him. He's a slip and fall artist. That's what they're called in insurance fraud. No more cash is going to exchange hands. In fact, what happened was, because he never varied his story, uh, and he would have to go to the emergency room afterwards because to make his falls realistic, he kept open cuts on one of his arms, which actually was nearly gangrenous by the time they arrested him. It's a heck of a way to make a living. Anyway, because he never varied his story, the insurance investigators told uh, police and ER doctors, if someone shows up claiming to have slipped on mint jelly, find a way to hold him because we're going to arrest him. And he ended up in jail. Handcuffs. Now... The point of the story is, this happens all the time in human life, where a certain pattern of evidence, when you're confronted with it, triggers in you a response. And that response is not to invoke chance or some random collocation of events, but rather to say a mind or an intelligence was implicated in that pattern coming about. Although I wouldn't really call this intelligent design because, you know, just get a job for good sake, you know. <laughs> Gangrene's a bad thing to have. Here's the question, the most important question for us tonight. What are going to be the limits on our freedom to use this notion of intelligence to explain? Now, 
Here's a simple distinction that we'll use a lot. We have events caused by intelligence, and we're going to leave that undefined for the moment. Like, you know, Mint Jelly Ridges uh, falls on Mint Jelly. And we contrast those normally in human experience with events caused by physics. By that, I mean everything that comes bottom up from nature, where physics is a shorthand for chemistry and other kinds of regular physical processes. And in those cases, the agent dissolves away. And in fact, it's important that the agent dissolve away because this distinction is very critical to a lot of what we do in human life. Imagine if you were serving on a criminal jury and it was a capital crime case, murder, and the defense attorney managed to persuade you that the defendant who's charged with murder actually had a brain tumor and he shows you know, x-rays and doctors come in and testify. And what the defense attorney does is provide a physical story for why the event happened. In other words, the murder was committed not as an act of free will, as a genuine murder, but because the person couldn't help themselves. There was a physical cause acting on them, and they didn't really have any agency, any free will. They just you know, did something bad, but it wasn't their fault. You wouldn't hold them guilty. Because we make this distinction, and we put a lot of weight on it. We say there are some events that are caused by a mind, and others that are caused by nature. And you can find that distinction actually going deep into human antiquity. Greek philosophers arguing about, is the world better explained by intelligence or by physics hundreds of years before Christ? So it's, it's you know, pretty distinguished distinction that we make. Now, here's a little definition, and it's not satisfactory. I'll admit it. This is not a good definition because the word intelligence is present, or the adjective, present in the thing to be defined and in the definition. But let's just use it for the time being. Intelligent design is the study of patterns in nature that are best explained as the result of intelligence. Now, you might be very unhappy and say we've just gone round in a circle. So rather than you know, parse the word intelligence 500 different ways, let me give you some more examples of how this operates in practice in human experience. And it's kind of a game show format, OK? So behind this door, we have a puzzle. Some puzzle that we wish to explain causally. All right? And we've got two options, two sets of options. So, you know, Monty Hall, or I don't even know if he's alive anymore. That shows how old I am. The game show host says, you get box one, and in box one are solutions of type X, thousands of them, you know, printed on little slips of paper. But they're all of that form. They're all there in box one. You can have that in relation to whatever puzzle is behind that door, or you can have box two. Now, the great thing about box two is you get all the type X solutions. Okay, so if there's a type X solution in box one, you get it in box two. They're all there. They're exactly the same with respect to that kind of answer. But you also get the type Y solutions. In addition, now, you don't know what these are yet, but I think everyone in this room would say the rational choice to make confronted with that setup is to take box two because you don't lose anything. Everything that's there in box one is going to be there in two, plus you get this additional option should you need it, depending on what is you know, behind that door. All right, so anybody here uh, study mineralogy, geology? You recognize that? I see a hand back. Quartz. Mm. Go Ohio State. This is quartz, and you can grow it. I can give you the recipe for quartz. You have to get silicon and oxygen ions in the right ratio in solution, and you can grow it. In fact, watch manufacturers like uh, Timex and other corporations grow great big vats of these because if you put a current through quartz, it oscillates at a very high frequency, and you can step that frequency down. It's quite regular and run a watch with it. All right, so let's look at our boxes. And let's say type X solutions are all those based on physics. We don't need the Y solutions in this case. Box one will be perfectly adequate, but box two would do the job as well. All right, now, how about this? If you know what it is, don't say. Give everybody a chance to look at it. Beautiful little symmetrical kind of glassy buttons. Quick show of hands, who thinks these are artificial? You don't have to hold your hand up, just kind of. Usually I get about half the audience thinks that they're 
artificial. These are tektites. When they were first discovered, there was a long debate in geology about whether they were natural or artificial objects. Now, in a case like this, box two is looking a lot more attractive because of the Y-type solutions. And let's say these are the design-type solutions, those involving a mind. You can read about this debate. It was fascinating. You had some geologists saying, there's no way a natural process could make that beautiful, symmetrical, little glassy button. And other geologists saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's be sure. Well, it turns out that there's a pretty good explanation in terms of what happens when a meteoritic body causes a melt at high impact. So you've got a lot of molten rock here, glassy material, and along this arc right here is the tektite that we saw on the previous slide. As it's cooling and falling through the air, the air pressure pushing up on the bottom of the sphere rounds it off to give you that button shape, and it cools and falls to the earth, and you find that little glassy button. We don't have these much in the United States, but they're abundant in Australia. So we go back to our solutions here. Excuse me before I get to that one. Again, box X is doing the job, but we might want Y. How about that? Physical anthropology, anybody? I would walk right by that because I don't have the relevant training. But someone trained in physical anthropology or archaeology would grab me by the arm and say, you know what, you just lost out. You stepped over a hand axe. If you, see, if you were to see this end on, it has a beautiful tapering shape where the edges are beveled. And if you hold it in your hand, it balances very nicely. It's a tool. Although the amount of artifice there seems minimal, you could collect whole classes of these, and they fall into the same general pattern. They were designed by a Stone Age intelligence, at least one, to perform particular functions, even though the level of design may be quite minimal and hard to see. Now here, that's going to fail. And for the science of archaeology, we need that option of a mind, not a strictly physical cause. And in a case like this, it's obvious. No one is going to say pigment arranges itself on board in that pattern without the agency of Leonardo. All right, so the general point here is this is a toolkit that everybody uses. And they use this toolkit in explanation and in daily life, again, irrespective of their particular personal philosophy. Now, you might say, look, I didn't come here tonight to hear about hand axes, you know. These are not examples from the natural sciences. All right, let me give you an example from the natural sciences where the integrity of science itself depends on our ability to detect the action of intelligence. And we can go back to our game show setup. If you do this, if you exclude mind arbitrarily before the evidence has a chance to speak for itself, you cannot do what is necessary in this next story. Again, a true story. You can read it about it in a wonderful book came out about uh, two years ago called Fantastic Plastic by a great young science writer in Boston. Hendrik Schoen was a young physicist at Bell Labs in solid state physics who was on his way to a Nobel Prize. He had a string of high profile papers in journals like Nature and Science that made the front page of the New York Times the results were so significant. Uh, in fact, because of the commercial potential of these discoveries, literally billions of dollars at stake in things like room temperature uh, superconductivity, Schoen beca was becoming an all-star, and people were you know, trying to replicate his results, and the problem is no one could replicate them. There he is in happier times. And, and what he did, his crime against science was so egregious that the University of Konstanz in Germany tried to take away his PhD in physics. They didn't actually succeed. He fought them in court and was able to hang on to it. But what he did was really bad. All right. No one could replicate his results. The great thing about Mother Nature, if I can personify her, is she exists independently of us. If I tell you I've discovered a cool new effect in superconductivity, let's say, it doesn't depend on me being there. I can give you the methods and materials, and you can replicate that result for yourself. That's how science works. 
because nature's out there operating on her own. I'm sorry for the pers you know, personifying her, but it's a handy way of referring to the, the reality. And the problem is what he claimed to have found that Mother Nature was doing, no one could copy. So Bell Labs got worried and they formed an investigative committee and they started to look at all his papers next to each other. It's just what insurance companies do. You get good samples and you start looking for patterns. And what they saw destroyed his credibility more or less instantly. Now, I know this is probably a little bit hard to see from where you're sitting, but these are two diagrams from two separate papers published by Sean. This one on a light emitting transistor published in Science. This one on an organic transistor published in Applied Physics Letters. These are different materials, different experimental setups, different conditions. But notice that the curves in these figures are largely identical right down to the noise. So the New York Times has taken this portion of this curve and this portion of this curve and blown them up here for you to see. And using Photoshop or some other software, you could align these right on top of each other. They match exactly. If I gave you a sheet of blank paper tonight, and I didn't tell you why, and I said, sign your name for me five times, there would be more variation in your five signatures than in those two lines, even though your signature is used by banks and other organizations to identify you. When they saw that, it was over. Because there's no natural cause for that kind of pattern. That's randomness coming from the instrumentation in those experimental setups, and the probabilities of those jagged lines are vanishingly small. To have them match for two independent experiments, you can see here from the account. And by the way, you can get the whole sad story. The PDF is available online of the investigative committee. They went through one experiment after another and they found these kind of anomalous patterns. The papers had to be retracted. Those patterns in those publications existed not because of a physical cause, but because of shown. So there's our puzzle behind the door and we're gonna need that. We're going to need one misguided young physicist, his intelligence or lack thereof, his mind in any case. All right, it's only human, you say to me. It's only human causation we're dealing with. And again, Paul, we didn't come here tonight to talk about things that were just human. All right, let's turn the temperature up now. We'll grab the knob on the philosophical oven and turn it from you know, 250 around to broil. Consider the SETI program. This is Jill Tarter. She is the real-life model for the Jodie Foster character in the movie Contact, also the novel Contact by Carl Sagan. She's an atheist. She's a radio astronomer. And her career is dedicated to looking for evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, in this photograph, it's 3 a.m. in Puerto Rico at the Arecibo Radio Telescope. It was a very large radio telescope built into a natural depression in the mountains of Puerto Rico. And I can tell you at 3 a.m. I would have been asleep for about four and a half hours. This is my view of the search for extraterrestrial life. <laughs> but it's an important problem. Is anybody else out there and how would we know? So they're, they're running pattern detection software here and they're looking for things that are diagnostic of intelligence where you can rule out natural causes because that's what you need to do. Now in the caption, this is what she says, the caption to that photo. Why would it be obvious? You all know what pi is. It's the ratio between a circumference of a circle and its diameter. There are the first 500 digits. You know there are web pages where you can go and you can put in your phone number and, and the search box will tell you where your phone number is in pi. But only your seven digit number. You can't, you can't attach your area code because even though pi has now been solved out to a very, very large mathematical object, it's still not big enough to include uh, your phone number plus the area code. But within our lifetimes, as pi gets bigger and bigger and bigger, all kinds of interesting patterns will be in there. Um, it's, a, it's a wild thing when you think about it. Anyway, you wouldn't need to see very much of that coming in on a radio transmission or a, you know, from on some narrow beam to tell you you've, you've nailed it. Because 
In our experience, mathematical relationships, mathematical objects like prime numbers or pi are produced by intelligences that can grasp those relationships. So if we put that behind the puzzle door, this is going to fail. This is what Jill Tarter is counting on to do her research, that she's going to be able to isolate that. Now, what would she actually know about what's at the other end of that signal? Only two things. One, they grasp mathematics. Two, they can manipulate the electromagnetic spectrum because it would have to be a very, very powerful beam to carry those numbers across intergalactic or interstellar space. But that's it. That's all she would know. Wouldn't be a member of Homo sapiens. And on that very slender basis of math and manipulating the spectrum, we'd have evidence of intelligence. So we're pushing, pushing, pushing. Let's push a little farther. I think everyone in the room would agree with this because it's basic rationality. But the reason you're here tonight is because you probably don't or you may not agree with this. Namely, that there is evidence in biology of intelligent causation. That's what brings us here. That's what makes this such a controversial topic. So you might say, yeah, I've got no problem with SETI. I've got no problem saying Stonehenge was caused by humans because it was, you know, it's the only rational inference. But proteins, the giant panda, Richard Dawkins, <laughs> these are biological objects. And if they had an intelligent cause, it wasn't a member of our species. It wasn't the familiar kind of intelligent cause that we know. So, Let's look at what is seen as the main reason modern science does not think intelligent design happened, namely the theory of natural selection. Dawkins here says, this theory that Darwin discovered gives a mechanistic causal, if you will, non-intelligent account of how we came to appear as if we were designed for a purpose. And this view is very widely held in modern biology. I'm sure if we went to talk to the biology faculty here at Ohio State, we'd hear it. Ernst Mayer had a long career at Harvard, very distinguished. He was one of the leading evolutionary biologists of the 20th century. And he defines Darwinian theory by its opposition to intelligent design. In this essay, he says, what really makes Darwinism Darwinism is that it rules out divine intervention or intelligent design. All right, that's a, that's a strong claim. We need to evaluate it. So let's do a case study in the kind of biological puzzle that Dawkins and Meyer say natural selection explains. To do that, we're going to have to do a little biology. And I apologize for that because I know you've probably been in lectures all day and you didn't come here tonight to hear another lecture. So let's move as quickly as we can, but carefully, through a formulation of natural selection that is, you know, robust and should be the part, part of the toolkit of any working biologist. It's a conditional. It starts with if. If the three conditions I'm going to describe exist, natural selection will occur. Well, the first one is variation in some trait. So if you look around the room, just within Homo sapiens, you see tremendous amount of variation from the single protein level all the way up to complex behavior. There are differences within our species. Those differences should make a difference to the number of offspring that you have where some trait that you have affects your reproductive output, increases it. And you need to be able to transmit that trait, its basis, between yourself and your offspring. So you need variation, selection, heredity. If these three conditions are satisfied, natural selection will occur. You can't avoid it. It's bound to happen. My wife, um, uh, who cheers for the state that will not be named, on Saturdays, is a pediatrician. And when she was doing general pediatrics, the American Academy of Pediatrics published a poster that they asked doctors to put on their waiting room wall, telling parents, don't expect to go home today with a prescription for an antibiotic. Because if your child has a mild illness that will resolve on its own, if we give you that antibiotic, chances are you're not going to take it properly. And you will be part of a very large and unhappy experiment where the next time that bacterial strain sees that antibiotic, it'll go right around it. 
in the competition between us and the bacteria, the bacteria are winning, and we are not able to cap keep up with them in terms of producing antibiotics, all of that due to the reality of this process and other things as well, like horizontal gene transfer, but we can leave that aside. This really happens. The question is, well, here's a very simple cartoon. That was a lot of words. This is a visual depiction. Let's say we have a, a single-celled species with the orange and yellow trait, and we introduce a selective condition here, the black line, that favors the yellow trait. Well, if we keep that condition around, there'll be a shift in the population as a whole over time such that if we take out the intervening generation, that's genuine change in a directional way. So there's natural selection in action, as you might see it in a bacterial population. The question is, can that process do the complexity building work that Darwin and Dawkins believe it can? So those are our three conditions, and they're like three legs of a stool. You need all of them. They're jointly necessary and sufficient, then, for natural selection to occur. Keep that in mind because we're going to ask what happens when one of them is taken away. Bottom line, if you can't leave offspring, whether you're a bacterial cell or a member of our species or anywhere in between, you're invisible to natural selection. So if I had the physique of Michael Phelps, which I very obviously do not, <laughs> and uh, you know the brain of, uh, let's say, um, Stephen Hawking, great body, great brain, but I'm sterile. My gonads are not producing viable sperm. I'm invisible to natural selection. It doesn't matter what else is good about me. The process, if I can personify it again, can't see me. I have to tell you, though, on March 16, 1992, Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, my wife and I, mostly my wife, I was a minor contributor, uh, successfully passed on genetic information to my now 20-year-old daughter, Hannah. So in that respect, I'm more fit than lots of other people who haven't done that. But natural selection as a causal process leaves many evolutionary biologists unhappy. This is not widely known, but it's the case. So here's an example. Conrad Waddington was an embryologist, one of the leaders in the neo-Darwinian synthesis in the 1960s. And at a famous meeting in Philadelphia, he put it this way. He said, the whole real guts of evolution love that phrase, which is how do you come to have horses and tigers and things is outside the mathematical theory. That is what we really want evolution to explain, how we came to have different types of animals, different types of plants and so forth, is left to one side by textbook theory. What he means here is population genetics. Coming closer to the present, you can find the same kind of disenchantment right throughout the biological literature. Andreas Wagner is a theorist at uh, University of Zurich, and in this paper published about a year ago, he said, we just don't know. Few of the principles that explain how li living things innovate can be accessed by natural selection and random variation. He concludes, he says, as the geneticist Hugo de Vries said in 1905, so that's, this has been a longstanding problem. Natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival. Here's why. And I'm, I'm, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk just about animals. Textbook theory never solved the problem of macroevolution, horses and tigers and things, because animals do not vary the way that natural selection requires. Now, to show you why, let's look at developmental biology, which was a missing piece in the neo-Darwinian account of evolution. This is one of my heroes, Francis Crick, depicted here near the end of his life. He worked at the Salk Institute in the last part of his life, Southern California. And in this paper from a evolutionary biologist in the UK, Gabriel Dover, Dover describes going to work with Crick at the Salk Institute. And Crick had a well-deserved reputation for being a gadfly. So he would confront people in the lunchroom or in the hallway and buttonhole them, you know, literally buttonhole them and say, I can tell you why you, you won't be able to solve the problem that you're working on. You don't really understand it. I mean, it was kind of offensive, actually, but more often than not, Crick was right. So Dover is saying, he made me feel like a 10-year-old when I went to work with him on the problem of macroevolution. And here's why. Crick said to Dover, you can't solve the problem of evolution until you know how organisms are put together. Now, what could he mean by that? 
What he means is the following. Let's suppose, and I, I apologize for these cartoons. Obviously, real organisms, I'll ha show you one in a moment, are more interesting than shapes in PowerPoint. But let's say we want to transform species A, which has this shape, into something like species B, where all of us would, would consider that a macroevolutionary transition. If A is an animal, it starts with a single cell, a fertilized egg. It's going to be built by a developmental process that's rather complicated, where there's a, a unfolding arborescence of developmental decisions that gets you from that single cell eventually to the adult. So if that's how A is constructed, and that's how B is constructed, to get A to turn into B, we've got to change the construction process. We've got to change the developmental pathway leading to those points. So when Crick says to Dover, you can't solve evolution until you know how this process works, what he means is this knowledge of how development works has prim got to be primary in your understanding if that's the transition in evolution that you wish to explain. Now, here's an important thing to keep in mind. The one thing you can't do if you're evolving is be temporarily dead. No temporarily, like, you know, 30 seconds dead, 10 seconds dead, doesn't matter, not allowed. So if our transition that we're trying to explain takes us through this, on those grounds alone we can rule it out. That couldn't have happened. In fact, this rule is used widely in evolutionary biology by investigators to adjudicate the plausibility of each other's stories. They'll say, look, you're not going to get through that stage. However this transition happened, it didn't happen this way, where these are developmental pathways here that are being modified. And here's the example we'll use. Gorgeous creatures. I fell in love with them about two years ago because I was involved in making a movie about butterflies. The North American monarch is a really amazing creature. The ones that hatched in late August, early September around here are on their way to Mexico. They are flying 2,500 miles to the mountains outside Mexico City using their onboard GPS. And these butterflies live nine months. Most butterflies in that species the rest of the year live three to four weeks. The ones that go to Mexico shut down their reproductive behavior, and they take a very long trip indeed. I won't talk about it tonight, but it's absolutely amazing. Now, I want to give you a metaphor for thinking about animal development. It's actually more than a metaphor. It's really pretty accurate. Tomorrow I'm driving to Pittsburgh. Those of you from the area know it has lots of chasms like this, some of them pretty deep which are spanned by bridges. And let's say this is deep enough that you definitely do not want to be in free fall to the bottom. Animal development is like a magic bridge in the following sense. This would be right at home in an Indiana Jones movie. Let's say this is 1,000 feet, and you're over here, and you see this bridge, and you start walking from that side over there. As long as you keep moving, the bridge will be there beneath your feet. The minute you stop, you know, look over or tie your shoe or whatever, the bridge disappears and down you go. Animal development is like this in the following sense. Once that fertilized egg begins to divide, it has to get to the end of its trajectory to be functional. For the sake of evolution, or if we think about it in terms of evolution, it's got to be able to reach reproductive capability, which is way over here in the adult state. So single-celled Organism, fertilized egg, divides, divides, and its progeny cells divide, and they're heading across here. If all goes well, they'll make it to reproductive capability. That's a real problem for natural selection, because natural selection may be powerful, and it is, but it's supremely dumb. If a new variation is going to be selected, it has to work now, at this particular slice in time, let's say. There's no saving a variation for later, like, well, that's a handy mutant. You know, I'll need it hundred generations from now, I'll just keep it around. The selection process requires immediate functionality, so building these long slender bridges across to a distant target is going to be a real challenge for natural selection. We'll come back to this slide later. Think about these, these questions. What kind of cause can do that? Can aim at a distant functional target? Can reuse genes and proteins depending on the context? Can establish the system first, that is the whole organismal system first, and then 
put the pieces in place? I'll answer that question later, but keep those in mind. Now, another he childhood hero of mine, Harry Houdini, being lowered by his feet into a water box. Three of his assistants kind of gamely watching there. What's the one thing Houdini will not let himself do as he's being lowered in? He's not going in without a backup plan, and probably a backup plan for the backup plan. You know, there's a clip on the web, um, and I'm sad to say I actually watched it, this was years ago, of a badly trained magician who built himself a death box in sand. And you can watch the whole thing, it's awful. He goes in, they close the lid, they put the sand on, and the box collapses. And by the time they get the sand out and you know, pull him out, he's dead, he's suffocated. You can be sure that Houdini has got a plan to get out if, in case his primary escape method fails. Keep that in mind because we're going to come back to it in the context of this problem, of getting through that temporarily dead stage. So here's the hero of the story, one of them anyway. This is a female monarch. The males have little dark pouches on either side of the abdomen here where they store pheromones, you know, cologne. <laughs> So my wife and I were in Mexico in February at their overwintering site, and it was like a singles bar, you know. It's like, hey, baby, you know, we got to get back up to Ohio. They use the pheromone. The males use the pheromones for what males and females do. I know you don't need to go into details, but here's the life cycle of a monarch. Probably, you know, you remember this from grade school biology. Egg, I'm a beautiful butterfly, basically an eating machine. It, it will multiply, the caterpillar will multiply its weight 3,000 times between hatching and when it goes into the, in, into the chrysalis. So that's the life cycle. Here's some of the details. There's the egg, carefully deposited on the underside of a milkweed leaf by the mother. Beautiful things when you look at them close up. There's a little breathing hole here on the top of the egg. Some of you may have seen this. The formation of the chrysalis, the the uh, caterpillar uh, forms itself into this characteristic J shape, and then it spins around carefully to make sure it's not touching anything, because when the chrysalis forms, if the chrysalis is touching anything, it will be damaged. So this is the mystery stage. I want to show you something cool about this, the cremaster and its silk pad where it attaches. This is a SEM of the cremaster, which is the hook type apparatus at the end of the chrysalis, and there's a silk pad that the caterpillar spins and deposits on the twig. Let me zoom in a little bit here. These hooks entangle into those silk strands like natural Velcro. Actually, Velcro is a copy of this kind of system in nature. Think about this from an engineering perspective. What would be the point of having the hooks if you didn't have the silk pad there to snag onto? But why have the silk pad if you don't have the hooks to do the job? So each of those components is necessary for that function. So there it is. And it gets the name chrysalis from these brilliant gold dots. They're a little hard to see in this slide that cover the surface or sort of decorate the surface of the chrysalis. No one knows what they do. Other species have them as well. In sunshine, they glitter. You can see them a long way off. What's going on here? In the seven to 10 days that the butterfly or the caterpillar turning into a butterfly is within there, the first thing that happens is massive cell death. The caterpillar is literally digesting itself away through carefully regulated processes that are uh, uh, known as apoptosis and autophagy. This literally means eating yourself. So it's being turned into a soup. I didn't have the heart to do it, but uh, in Florida when we were filming the movie, a worker at a butterfly reserve there took a monarch chrysalis and took a scalpel and sliced it sort of head to tail along this axis and poured the contents out on a cover slit. And it looks like transparent jello. There's no structure to, that you can discern there. I couldn't do it because I want the caterpillar to make it, you know, to get a chance to be a butterfly. So that's the first thing that's happened, that happens is chewing yourself up. Then Cell populations that were present in very, very small form in the caterpillar, plus the raw materials that come from this, turn into the structures of the adult butterfly. 
So if we go to the other end of the story, after about a week, you can see the uh, exterior of the chrysalis begins to thin, and it gets very dark, and you can make out the butterfly within. Then the chrysalis case cracks along the head-to-tail axis here. Out comes the butterfly. And it does a couple of things at that point. The first thing it does is it pumps up its wings. When the wings first come out, they're very soft and velvety, useless for flight. So using muscles in its abdomen, it pumps fluid through these veins to extend the wings, and then they dry and become hard to enable flight. But what it does that's really cool is it makes its proboscis. I don't know how well you can see, but there's a little curling tongue here. And when it first comes out, it's in two pieces, like two halves of a straw. Half a straw is not a straw. Half a straw will provide no suction for you. But in each side of those pieces are little channels that fit together. So what the butterfly does is it unrolls that tongue to knit those two halves together to make a functional drinking tube. Again, from an engineering perspective, what's the value of half a straw? You need both pieces plus the behavior of unrolling it to put it together. All right, let's go back to Houdini going into his box. And we all know he's not going in unless he knows how to get out, plus having a backup plan in case something should go wrong. The alternative is unacceptable to Houdini. Well, in a very real sense, the caterpillar faces the same problem. It will not form this structure unless there is a well-programmed plan to get out. In the course of evolution, there was no point at which the caterpillar said, the thing to do today is to digest 85% of my tissue down to amino acids. And then we'll look and see what happens after that point. You're not going to form a chrysalis unless you've got a plan for getting out the other side. How did natural selection, a very powerful but supremely dumb process, get through that stage and back out given that it has no foresight. This cannot happen in evolution. But for all appearances, when you're in a chrysalis for a week, you are neither caterpillar nor butterfly. You are waiting to turn into a butterfly. The question, the scientific question, and I've put this to biological audiences on several occasions, natural selection as a causal process does not seem to be able to build these kinds of networks if reproductive output is over here. Now, this is a very simple kind of animal, hypothetical animal. Five cells arranged in, this, or arranged in this linear pattern. But let's say to get them there from our starting point, we need this cell lineage, this branching of cell division. If reproductive output is over here, it's very hard to see how natural selection could put the instructions in place to do this to get you over there given that one of its necessary conditions is well downstream. Organisms today solve the problem of building embryos by having parents that give them the instructions. But this won't work for evolution because, after all, it's the origin of the whole system that we wish to explain. We can't invoke it. You know, it would be a natural miracle, a naturalistic miracle, I, I should say. Now, look, this problem was well known to Darwin 150 years ago. It's much harder to solve today because the amount that we know about butterflies is greatly increased. We know the proteins, or at least some of them that are involved. We know the developmental process, at least some of the details, things that Darwin didn't know. The problem is so hard to solve from a Darwinian perspective that some scientists, like this gentleman here, have resorted to rather creative solutions. Now, there's a, there's a backstory to this paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy uh, in 2009 that's worth telling. This paper was so controversial that after it appeared, the National Academy as an organization eliminated the pathway that this author used to publish the paper. There used to be a route into publication where if you knew a member of the National Academy, and he did, he was friends with Lynn Margulis, a maverick evolutionary biologist, your National Academy friend could fast track your paper and speed up the review process and get the paper into print. This paper caused such a stink that after it appeared, the National Academy eliminated that pathway. You can't do that anymore. But here's why. In the paper, 
On the first page, the, Donald Williamson, he's a zoologist at the University of Liverpool, said, look, Darwinian theory just won't work. He said, it's bizarre that this could have happened by descent with modification. Because caterpillars and what they turn into, those life stages are so different that you could not build it in a step-by-step -step way using a process like natural selection. He said, I, it just won't work. We need to try something very different. So here's his solution. Start with something that kind of looks like a caterpillar. It's a velvet worm. We actually don't have them in North America. You have to go to other parts of the world to see them. Uh, and it's not in the same phylum, the same large taxonomic group as insects. But, you know, it does kind of look like a caterpillar. It's got the tubular shape and the little stubby legs and so forth. So that gives you your caterpillar half of the story. Then, Williamson says, find some arthropod, some insect that doesn't go through a metamorphosis, like grasshoppers. When grasshoppers are born, newly hatched baby grasshoppers look very much like the adult into which they're going to grow. Their wings will get a little bigger, they'll develop their sex organs, but grasshoppers kind of always look like grasshoppers. They never go through this complete metamorphosis that we see in butterflies. All right, so caterpillar half of the story, insect half of the story, flying insect probably, and they get together in a singles bar and it all works out. That's never, ever going to happen. That would be like you hybridizing with a clam, okay? The, I'm sorry, and you guys laugh, but I admire his courage for doing this, even though he got in a lot of trouble, because what he said was the existing explanations are so poor, the Darwinian explanations, that we need to try this kind of radical hybridization hypothesis, which, you know, it's a bold, Conjecture, it's never going to happen. The genetic incompatibilities alone would cause the system to crash, even if you were able to fertilize across this great distance. He's trying to solve a problem that looks like it will not yield to powerful but dumb processes. To get across that bridge, you need to know where you're going. And you need to have some way of getting there where you can bring together the elements that are required to achieve the distant function. We know this from our own experience. You know, having a laser pointer is a great, this is a great little device to have. But at some point, someone had to sit down and say, what would it take, you know, to put a bright dot on a screen? That's a nice function to perform. What would we need to bring together to reach that endpoint? Or an iPhone. Or a MacBook, which my wife gave me as a surprise birthday present, and I will never, ever go back to a PC. <laughs> <laughs> This is, what, this is what intelligence does. Intelligence, uniquely in our experience, is able to visualize those distant endpoints and bring together what's required to hit the target. And intelligence can do this. It can reuse lower level modules in different ways depending on context. So the same protein in a butterfly that has a particular role in a caterpillar can be repurposed for an unrelated role in the adult because the cause has a brain, has a mind, and can see this is a great little DNA binding protein. I'll use it here, 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 and here in these different roles. The system as a whole, top down, will tell it what to do. That's the kind of cause that can do this. How am I doing on time? Not too bad. All right, now, I know there are skeptics in the audience, so let me deal with your unhappiness. God of the gaps. Yes, it's a big puzzle. Yes, it's unsolved, but that's what science does. And you need to give science the time and you know, space and money required to solve a hard problem like butterfly metamorphosis. Don't jam God or an intelligent designer, to use the politically correct euphemism, into the gaps in our knowledge. Because there's an expanding wavefront of knowledge in science, and it's going to sweep over that puzzle eventually. And if you've jammed God in there, Science is going to roll right over him at some point in the future. Don't do it. Now, actually, this is said to me, I'm a Christian, this is said to me by many of my friends in the sciences who are also Christians. They're very wary of intelligent design because they think it commits this fallacy. And I have to be honest, it is dangerous to make this kind of inference. Science 
runs the risk of being wrong. And if you use an idea like design and science, you could be wrong. But let's put that to one side, because that's a problem that everybody faces. Everybody runs the risk of being wrong if they say anything about the world. I want to show you that not every problem that we can form in our minds, that, you know, we ask a question of nature, how did such and such an event happen, is going to have a solution in the terms that we prefer. And then I'll stop and we can have Q&A. All right, thought experiment. 2042, and I'm still alive by the benefits of medicine and God's grace. I'm still alive. I'm old and I'm bored, and my nephew is working on Mars. Got a big lab up there, tens of thousands of people. So I pick up my 2042 equivalent of an iPhone, you know, and I say, I want to talk to Asa. That's really his name. And I say, call him and see how he's doing today. I punch in his number. I'm down here somewhere. And I have this question that I put to nature. How can I have communication in real time with my nephew who's on Mars? Just the way we will in a few minutes when you come to the microphone and ask your questions, we'll be talking back and forth in real time. No lag. No time lag. Now, this is a syntactically correct, grammatically correct English sentence. You know what it means. It forms a research problem. I'm asking the question, how can I communicate with my nephew there without any lag, just in real time? I want to talk to him, find out how he's doing. That's a research problem. Arguably, there's a gap in our knowledge where that research problem exists, and I want to fill it with something, some discovery. And what you say to me is, Paul, it's just never, ever going to happen unless our current understanding of physics is completely wrong. You will never have a conversation in real time with anybody on Mars because there's a speed limit, right? So Mars comes as close as it does to the Earth right about now in the fall. All right, there's a speed limit. It'll be about a six-minute round trip. So I, you know, boom, 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 boom. Asa, how's it going? Then I go make myself a cup of coffee, check the mail, you know, come back, five, six, three, you know, I hear him. He's there. I'm okay. It's kind of dry up here. You can't solve the problem because you're putting a question to nature for which there is no knowledge coming back. What you need to do in a case like that is listen to what nature is telling you. And the rational thing to do in science is not to keep asking questions that don't have answers. But if your research goes up a blind alley, turn around and go the other way. So if you're worried about the God of the gaps with respect to intelligent design, recognize that many of the gaps that modern science thinks are there in our knowledge may not be real. They may be as, as unreal as this kind of question. For instance, the question, how did life start by an unknown natural process? Currently, there are about as many theories to answer that question as there are investigators in the field, which is not a healthy state for a science to be in. But people are trying to solve that problem. If it turns out that the first cell did not come about by, an, uh, by a chemical pathway, <laughs> those guys did it, no. If that didn't actually happen, in fact, if the first cell was intelligently caused, then asking the question of how it happened naturally is putting a question to nature for which there's no knowledge coming back. And it doesn't matter how hard you work or how long you try, you're just not going to learn the answer until you listen to what nature is telling you. So in a case like that, you change the question. Your background assumptions were erroneous, so you change the question, you try a different path. You don't keep butting your head into the wall at the end of that alley, you know, until you get a big bloody spot there. The problem of macroevolution, as I've described it, may be unsolved, not because we haven't tried hard enough, but because the questions we're asking are wrong. And we need to consider the possibility that these objects, including this one, were caused by intelligence, not by a natural process. And we need to allow that possibility back into science where it was when Darwin was a young man. When Darwin set sail on the Beagle, as a 22-year-old, uh, the possibility of intelligent design was live in science. In fact, you could say that evolutionary theory itself came out of a theistic cradle. 
Unfortunately, evolutionary biology pulled the ladder up behind itself after they, think, after they thought they solved the problem, the ladder that Darwin himself used, and I just want to get that ladder back down on the ground. All right, I, I probably ran way over, I'm sorry. Let's, uh, doing okay? All right, um, I've got more slides, but you've probably listened long enough, so why don't we have some Q&A, which as I said, is the fun part of the night for me. Thank you for being so attentive. You've been a wonderful audience. All right, well, it's my mic now. Anyway, if anyone wants to come up, the mic will be here, and uh, feel free to shoot Dr. Nelson some questions, and uh, as, he, as he said, he enjoys answering them. So we're, and anything, you know, just come on up. Don't be shy. If you don't, I'm going to ask the first question. How does the complexity of organisms be explained except by design? How does the coagulation system, the utterly complex, the immune system, color vision, etc.? And this is Dr. Behe's argument. How can that be explained? It's too complex except by design. Thank you for your question. Um, I guess what I would say is that uh, complexity by itself uh, could be explained by chance or by intelligence. Uh, after all, a, uh, a pile of rubble, I walked by the building site just north, is it north of here? Anyway, they're, they're putting in, it looks like a new heating facility. There's lots of rubble in that part of the campus. And if we went down there and looked at it and calculated all the possible ways that that rubble could have been arranged, the particular patterns of rubble in that building yard are extremely improbable. But none of us is going to say that particular arrangement was caused by design. So complexity just by itself does not allow you to infer design. The reason that you can infer design, I think, reasonably in biology with complexity is, is its complexity that's highly specified. It does something. So in the cases you mentioned of the, of the blood clotting cascade, there's a particular functional target being hit by that system. Organisms that produce blood need to keep the blood inside. When you have a cut, if you don't have that cascade, as hemophiliacs do not, they're missing some of the key proteins, you run the risk of bleeding out a, a vital fluid. So there's a particular very tightly focused functional target that the complexity is, is aimed at. And I think the other things you mentioned, such as vision and so forth, uh, provide not just a complex system. Everyone agrees it's complex. but there's a second arm to the pincer, and that is it's specified in terms of its function. And again, I would say universally in our experience, when we see that complexity with a particular pattern that's being hit, it's a reliable indicator of design. And it's really the only reasonable explanation. So in the case of my slide here, you know, in the first century AD or the first century common era when the island of Britain was becoming a colony of Rome. This was already thousands of years old. It's a very old arrangement of monoliths. And I'm sure the Roman centurions who saw it, those of you who have been there in the UK, it's on this plain outside Bath, they made an inference. Monoliths of that size and arrangement do not form patterns like this unless someone intended them to. It was true then that Stonehenge was designed complex pattern. It's true today. It will be true when our current theories of physics are long gone. These inferences to design that human beings make are among the most stable things that we know. So I'm, I guess I agree with you that complexity of the right type implicates design, and really it's the only reasonable explanation, unless you have a philosophical commitment to another kind of answer. And really, I didn't have time for this. Well, 
it's actually the very next slide. This rule dominates scientific thinking. It's an imperative. That's what I used to say to my daughters when they wanted to go to the mall and they hadn't done their homework. I'd use an imperative like that. They didn't have a choice, right? Homework first, mall later. This rule, which here is being announced by the National Academy of Sciences, tells you if you're an investigator, a scientific investigator, and you pop open the lid on your toolbox of possible causes, all that you're going to find in there are natural things and processes, where this means something without a mind. Now, Darwin himself would not have recognized this as a young man because he didn't actually believe it. Newton and Kepler would not have recognized that rule. But that rule constrains modern science in a way that I think is really unfortunate. And I would say that even if I were an atheist. Go back to my game show setup. I want all the possible options on the table because the world, the universe, is a very surprising place. And if I need that notion of intelligence to explain, I want it available to me. As a rule of thumb, well, maybe, yeah, you try the available natural causes, but you don't have to stop there. So anyway, I'm sorry, that's a long-winded answer to your question, but I think set free from this rule, the reasonable thing to infer when you see the specified complexity of life is an intelligent cause. I can't believe the rest of you agree with me. That's really surprising. There's got to be some people out there who really disagree. It's only Tuesday. I mean, if this was a Friday talk, you could all be reasonably tired. But Cool. So do you see, because I'm thinking, based on what I see in science, it appears that the universe is a lot older than a lot of people on kind of the the young earth side kind of infer, but at the same time I see there's issues with evolution naturalistically because we have the second law of thermodynamics, so we have things from going from greater order to disorder in pretty much all cases. So it's, in some sense, I kind of feel like the only way, logical way to go about it is if you accept both on some level. So would you agree with that or? Well, um, you'll notice that I did not talk at all about the, the chronology of the universe in my presentation, and that's because, um, it, it, to me, it's really not a central issue. Um, the, the ancient Greeks who argued about design versus physics, or design versus natural causes, had really no conception of the age or dis the size of the universe, the age of the Earth. But they grasp that this was the fundamental question on which everything else rested. So the universe could be much, much older even than it, what is it, 13.9? What's the, what are current estimates, something like that, in that ballpark? Um, billion years old, make it 50 billion years old, uh, 100 billion years old. The kinds of processes that, that would be required to build a cell uh, don't benefit from increased time because the chemistry goes in the wrong direction. If you take, for instance, a piece of hamburger and leave it in a glass of water on your kitchen counter and just leave it there and you know, re replenish the water periodically, that, the proteins in that hamburger are going in one direction and that's away from being proteins. The water in th that glass is going to attack the peptide bonds mm -hmm. and that protein's going to come apart. So having more time for what you need to do to build a cell is not necessarily a good thing. If the chemistry is going the wrong way, you can have all the time you want, you're not going to build a cell. So I guess what I would say is don't get hung up on the question of time. It's relevant, but it's a secondary question to this one, which is are we allowed to use intelligence to explain when the evidence calls for it? I think anyone in this room who wants to who thinks of themselves as a free, curious human being should never accept a restriction like this without an adequate justification. And that should be your attitude, whatever your religious view happens to be. So anyway, bottom line, I don't think time is really where the action is. Okay. I wasn't saying as far as time. I was just saying that I think that 
regardless of the framework, for things to kind of work out, you have to have something greater to step in, to have, you know, to basically jump a gap of non-existence and jump from there to life and from there to consciousness, so. I think, I think you did touch in your question on a really deep question, a puzzle, and that is, was the initial state of the universe special? There's a physicist at Caltech named Sean Carroll who's written a wonderful book on the arrow of time where he tries to address this question of it looks like the starting state of the universe was very special and we've been running downhill since and he's not quite sure how to solve that puzzle. So I think I would agree with you on that. I mean, you say that the statement is that science should only use scientific things to explain things. But once you start invoking intelligence into anything, where do you stop? I mean, for the development of vision, do you have, we, ha we have a pretty good idea of how that developed over time, and there's different eyes that have different levels of magnification and so on. But if you invoke intelligence once, when do you stop invoking it, and why would you keep researching it if you do in invoke intelligence? I think what you would need to do is just ordinary testing. Um, there are many examples in the history of science where patterns that were thought to be intelligently caused uh, turn out to have a natural cause. For instance, uh, in the mid-1960s, as radio astronomy was developing, signals were detected that were extremely regular, remarkably so. And for a long period of time, many months in fact, one of the live candidate explanations was an intelligent beacon. A very powerful beacon, but something that had been caused by an extraterrestrial mind. Until a model was developed of a spinning, very dense star putting out a beam as it turned a pulsar, which is the current explanation for these very, very regular signals. Actually, they're not signals in the sense of intelligently caused. What's going on there? What's going on is you have a candidate hypothesis, namely intelligence, and you run at it various possible natural candidates. It's ordinary testing. Well, it's not ordinary testing when you're saying you are supposed to assume an intelligence. If you're assuming an intelligence, that means you're throwing out the other explanation. But when you you're get... basically begging off how to explain it. That's what you're doing. Mm, think about it this way. When you get a text on your phone, or an email, what do you infer about the source of that pattern? I'm not sure what you mean. Like, you got a cell phone, I assume? Yeah. Okay, you get a text, mm -hmm. and it says, meet me at the student union, which gives a time, or can you believe he said, or can you believe he asked her out, blah, 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 whatever it happens to be. Okay. What, what do you assume about the cause of that pattern that's there? I assume that my phone sent it. Okay. Have you ruled out all the possible natural causes for that? Well, the, I mean, there is no spontaneous generation of the signal. I mean, the signal is not going to be spontaneously coming from nothing. I mean, but there's, okay. there, there I, is I, a non-zero there's a non-zero probability that what you have on your cell phone actually was not generated by an intelligence but by a natural cause. It could have happened. But you and no one in this room would entertain that possibility because when you see certain patterns, you, you run through, in fact, you, your mind does this for you. You're not even conscious of it. You eliminate natural cause explanations and you comfortably terminate you know, the, your inference with this was caused by intelligence. It's not spooky. It's not, there's nothing irrational about it. The, you know, it's something, in fact, that you, depend on for your daily life. And the question is, can you do it in science? And I think you can. I don't think you can. I mean, af as soon as you start invoking intelligence, you kind of throw out science. You really do. Um, is if you, if once you invoke intelligence, you're not, you're not going to think about the answer. Like, so they, let's, let's take the protein, for example. Protein folding is a complex problem. Right. How proteins have their forms. Right. 
that doesn't, that's only in their current state. You don't see the other steps that might have happened in between. You're throwing out those other explanations about how that particular structure evolved. It didn't evolve through chance. It evolved through non-random chance, which is kind of the point. But if I make an intelligent design, let's say I make an intelligent design hypothesis about this particular structure, which is actually a multi-protein complex. It's a chaperone. And it's a nursery for baby proteins. They fold in this inner chamber here. This complex associates with the molecular machine, the ribosome, that makes proteins. All right. Now, I say that was caused by intelligence. And part of the testability of my claim is to say the natural pathways to this structure defy chemistry. Amino acids in solution do not form structures like this. The chemistry goes in the other direction. And in fact, on a, on a plausible early Earth, you wouldn't have just 20, actually it's 22, protein-forming amino acids. You'd have hundreds of them, of both hands, all competing and, and with each other. So there is a, there's an empirical payoff to my claim, which is to say, if this did form as you said it did, we should see the following. And we don't. But your, your hypothesis is not testable. Of course it is. No, it's not. Yeah. It's not. It is not if, I say, if I say that the natural behavior of amino acids in water is the following, we can go in the lab and see if that's true. Yeah, but, there's a big but there. Your but is that there's nothing controlling the process. If, I'll, I'll give you an example. So if you have monkeys typing on a computer, trying to type Hamlet, and you have and basically you leave them at it, you have hundreds of millions of chimpanzees trying to type at computers to make this Hamlet. It's not going to happen in the age of the universe. But if you have, if you, like, I guess you concentrate on one chimpanzee who writes a certain number of characters that Hamlet is, and you just preserve the letters that he got right, then that... Can I stop you right there? Who knows what's right? The head chimp? I mean, someone has got to be well, keeping track of what, of, and, and preserving those occasional variations that are closer to Hamlet than gibberish. The problem with that kind of example is, unless you provide the target antecedently and have some way of saving the correct variations on your way to the target, the chimps are going to wander on a random walk, and they will never get any closer to Hamlet than gibberish. Well, yeah, but if intermediate forms have functional capability in other ways, then you can get there. I would agree, but only if the function lies along a pathway where each step of the way can be preserved by something like natural selection. The problem for the scenario with the proteins is that this has its function when it is doing its particular job. That point lies well downstream from the actual chemistry involved in building this. So. I think, uh, we'll have to move on to the next question. I think the difference between us is that you think design is not testable, and I think it's actually tested all the time. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you something funny. If you want to have a productive career in science, attack intelligent design. The journals, the best journals in the world will throw their doors open to you. Um, you can publish a paper in Nature or Science critiquing intelligent design, and it'll go in just like that. There are people who are doing this. It's funny because Darwin's first exposure to evolution as a young man was reading criticism of the idea from his mentor, uh, Charles Lyell. Future scientists may have their first exposure to intelligent design by reading critiques of it. But I'm sorry, it's a good question you raised, but we really should move on. I mean, just for the chaperone proteins, if it's not a chaperone protein in the beginning, it doesn't mean it can't be evolved into Is it possible that we would figure out how the metamorphosis of, metamorphosis of a butterfly works to the point where we know whether or not it could have evolved? Um, I think so. Actually, I would say that uh, that with increased knowledge, you're going to you're going to go in one of two directions: either the evolutionary pathway will become more and more clear, or the implausibility of any kind of evolutionary pathway will become more and more clear. So 
the great thing about science, one of the great things, is that knowledge does accumulate. And as it accumulates, certain hypotheses you know, become less plausible. Um, my own conviction is that there's enough information already to make design more plausible. And the problem I face ha doesn't have anything to do with the evidence. It has to do with this rule. Um, you know, I'm old enough. This tells you how old I am. I can remember the NBA before the three-point shot. He's really old. How did they get that old guy to talk to us? It, what happened was play in the NBA got boring. It was boring. And there's something very beautiful about a long arcing shot from the, that three-point line. Everyone likes to see it. But to make that happen, and to change the actual play, they had to say at one point, we got to change the game. We got to change the rules. We do this all the time. And if this rule is inhibiting science, and I think it is, it's we got to change it. So, anyway, yes, I think that that day will come. Hi, I just have a comment more than anything, and uh, maybe if I'm the last question, it might be a good one, or last comment, or it might be a good one to end on. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for the very interesting presentation. And um, I guess, you know, I think it's always great to be exposed to both sides of any position. And you've done a great job of uh, illustrating the issues uh, from an intelligent design perspective. And I just wanted to throw out that if anybody is interested in the evolutionary perspective on some of these issues and some of the questions that have come up, there's a great website called talkorigins.org that you might want to check out. Thank you. I'm regularly lampooned there. Hello. Um, I guess I have a question about, um, like, when you talk about that intelligence has somehow um, helped evolution and the involving of, like, living organisms, then, like, have you ever a question about, you know, where does that, like, who created the intelligence itself? Intelligence, um, you know, is a, is a funny kind of thing. It's enormously hard to define, you know, to give necessary and sufficient criteria to capture intelligence. It's like trying to define life or art. It's one of those concepts that is a, that's really, really tricky. Um, but I think you have ultimately two options. Taking in the whole framework, the framework of the whole universe, all the way back to the beginning. Either physics was primary, in other words, something without a mind, was the initial stuff of the universe. Or something with a mind was the initial stuff of the universe, or the, or the start. Uh, but those really are your final options. And the funny thing about explanation, when we explain things, it always ends somewhere. And if it's, if it's unsatisfactory to you to say that you would end with a mind or intelligence, Recognize that the other option is just as possible matter, and it's just as final. So if really, if you come down to those two options ultimately, either the primacy of physics or the primacy of intellect, um, one of them is going to win. One of them is going to be the ultimate source of everything. And there's no getting behind. There's no getting behind that point. Explanations eventually end. They eventually terminate. It may not be emotionally satisfying, but that's what explanations do. They run into the final explainer. That's the sort of causally primary thing. You can see, it's fascinating to look at the ancient Greek philosophers, long before modern science, long before anything that we would call science. This is the question they focused on. You have a follow up? Well, oh, I just want to know, because I'm, like, I guess, personally like agnostic. So, I, and I've always, like, as a, as a biology, bi biology major, I always thought, um, like, I would be okay with not knowing. Um, I would be, like, okay with ignorance rather than, um, I guess, like, coming up with answers that might not be true. Like, I mean, I guess, how, how did you, like, push that step, you know, towards, like, Christianity or maybe other religions? Well, um my own, my own Christian faith does not rest on science. If you want to know why I'm a Christian, take any of the Gospels. Luke is my personal favorite. Uh, read any of the Gospels. But if the Gospels are unpersuasive to you, 
then nothing I can say about science will make the least bit of difference. So my own Christian faith comes from the Bible, not from science. Science is important, but if we, if we didn't have the Bible, there would, wouldn't be any Christians on this planet. And it's, it's God's revelation in the Bible, I think, that, that makes Christianity what it is. So I, I need to be very clear about that. Science cannot take the place of God revealing himself to human beings. Science is something that we do, and it's highly fallible. I have a friend at the University of Minnesota who's writing a book right now about the nature of science, and the title is To Air is Science. And it's really the case. You can't name a great scientist who didn't make spectacular mistakes. Darwin certainly did, Newton did, Kepler did. Go right down the line. One of my heroes, Francis Crick, got a lot of things wrong. If you're afraid of making mistakes, science is the wrong field to be in. But in terms of my faith, I, I, I need to be honest with you, it doesn't rest on science. Science is an important part of my life. I love it. I think it makes life interesting. You know, we're, there's, you never know what we're gonna discover next but it's not where my faith comes from. Is that clear? I just wanted to be really clear about that. Yeah. Hi. Um, sometimes people make this fundamental mistake of like getting confused with science, like natural science, versus the scientific method, which I think is like the mistake in everyone's question. So could you explain that articulately, like the difference between like the scientific method, like using also sociology, which is not a natural science? So, so like when you like say, I guess people say if you um, put in intelligence design, you're getting away from like facts and stuff where intelligence design can be observed or like, can like explain that more articulately to people, like the difference between Sure, them? sure. Um, to me, the scientific method as it's usually found in a science textbook, a series of steps, hypothesis formation, observation, testing and so forth, mm -hmm. is just a formalization of common sense. Before we had a name for it, people were using the scientific method. People in antiquity knew perfectly well that, you know, when the pot of oil was empty, it was empty. It wasn't going to spontaneously fill up with cooking oil. So the scientific method is a formalization of a particular kind of way of thinking where you run various checks on what you say to see if you might have made a mistake. Natural science narrowly defined concerns all those parts of science where you don't use, there's no reference to humans. And the break comes typically at psychology. Psychology, sociology, those parts of knowledge that deal with human agency are usually split off from natural science because all of a sudden things get a whole lot more complicated. But you still have in psychology this method of hypothesis formation, testing, and so forth to check yourself. The, I think the place maybe, you can tell me if I'm wrong, where I would disagree with you, is I actually think that many of the natural sciences use intelligence detection. I'll give you one example that I didn't mention here, but it's very interesting. There are um, satellites right now going around the planet looking for chemical signatures. And the chemical signatures they're looking for, they're, they're observing the surface of the planet, would be produced by major polluters. So the presence, for instance, of heavy metals in concentrations that could only be brought about by someone dumping them out of a factory. That satellite is looking for those patterns, relaying that information to a lab where someone is saying, we need to go to Southern California where the metal plant is dumping tailings into the environment at concentrations that cannot be explained by any natural process. It's because they're violating the EPA regulations or something that's often debated heatedly in current culture, the global warming controversy. The global warming controversy turns on whether human-caused pollution is the source of the change in climate that we're, uh, that we're seeing. And that depends on being able to distinguish what we do from what nature herself does. So I think there are lots of natural sciences, you know, on the natural science side of the split, that actually use intelligence detection. It's just not called that. So anyway, you have an unhappy expression, so. Oh, no, sorry. No, I was just asking you to explain. I wouldn't like making the comment. I just want you to explain that because people get them confused sometimes. They don't yeah. like, they think like natural science is like defines what science means. Right. So. 
I just want you to, ex to explain it. Sorry. Okay. Well, I, I think of science, you know, science, actually, if you look at the origin of the word, comes from Latin, mm -hmm. scientia, and it means knowledge. And if, it, if it's knowledge, I would be willing to call it science. So I have a rather broad definition of science, but I'm obviously a crazy person, so. <laughs> um, thank you for your question. Um, okay, with all of the like concrete facts behind biology and chemistry and physics supporting intelligent design, why do you think scientists who are like trying to find the answer are so quick to discredit it since they want to find the answer, but they would rather go and think of a different theory that doesn't have that's an excellent question, and I, I hope I don't step on anyone's toes. Maybe I will. I'll try to tread lightly by answering it this way. If you think about evolution, as Darwin came up with it, and compare it to other scientific theories, like plate tectonics, the germ theory of disease, the wave-particle duality of light, and so forth. So you run through all the scientific theories you know, then you look at evolution. Evolution is the theory about us. And because of that, it carries a lot more weight. When you have a theory that refers to your origin or the origin of every human being that you know, including their moral behavior, uh, lots of things that, that really transcend natural science, it's impossible to keep the temperature in the room down. So I think uniquely of all scientific theories, evolution carries that baggage and when you do something like what I'm doing, you challenge its adequacy, it's more than just a theory out there. It's the theory that refers to us. And because of that, politics gets involved, public school controversies, you name it. Makes it interesting, but it also makes it very hard you know, to have a career. I'll tell you, I got a fellowship at University of Chicago in the philosophy department even though I worked on evolutionary biology, I would never have had a fellowship in the biology program in a million years. Because even as an undergraduate, I had a certain notoriety for being a crazy person, you know? So the philosophers, they're, they're just, they are crazy, so they'll give fellowships, you know? <laughs> they'll give fellowships to people like me, but it's really risky to be in a, bi a biology program and to play around with these ideas. You can kill your, your academic career unless you're very, very cautious. Um, I like to tell people that it's a sad fact, but American biologists in particular have scopes trial antibodies. So when they hear creation evolution, challenging Darwin, all those you know, trigger phrases, they have the intellectual equivalent of a violent immune reaction. That's not the case in China. And it's not the case in Europe. I, when I've lectured in both of those settings, Christianity is sufficiently dead in Europe that it's not, they're so postmodern, it doesn't really scare them. There's no chance of, of someone like George Bush being elected in France, let's say. So they can entertain challenges to Darwin much more easily than here in the United States where the political controversy is really hot. And in China, when I was there in 1999, they were wide open. They don't have the Scopes trial antibodies, and they're wide open to considering alternatives. You know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We'll try something else. So, come on, there's got to be a few more good questions out there. Thanks, Dr. Nelson. Uh, do you think the notion of entropy plays a role in the advocacy of intelligent design? Not for me personally, mainly because I, 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 I think it entropy belongs in thermodynamics, and uh, I think I pick up the story with biochemistry. I'm sure there's some, some thermodynamics in biochemistry, but the problem with entropy historically in this debate is the, is the concept has been misused and misunderstood, um, and I, I personally kind of steer clear of it. Uh, but, you know, if we go back to, to the chaperone here, just from biochemistry, you can get a pretty good handle on the natural behavior of the constituents of that protein complex. You know, a protein like that or a protein complex like that outside of a cell is not going to get more complicated and interesting. The chemistry is going to drive it in, in completely the other direction. Um, in fact, uh, a colleague and I 
want to perform what we call the Humpty Dumpty experiment, where we take E. coli or some other bacterial cell, put it in a sterile buffer, and somehow perturb the membrane to allow the contents of the cell to pass out. Now, that cell, formally speaking, is dead. But everything that you would need and you'd be thrilled to get in an origin of life experiment, like very long strands of DNA, a ribosome, polymerases, all the mo molecular machinery for the cell is there. It's just going the wrong direction. And the point of doing the Humpty Dumpty experiment is to watch what happens. Nobody thinks that cell is going to come back to life or give rise to another cell, even though every target molecule for an origin of life researcher is present in that sterile buffer. There's something really spooky about the living state that it's possible to lose it. It's very hard to build it bottom up from chemistry. So, sorry, more than you wanted to hear. I personally do not use entropy in my thinking about intelligent design uh, because I think the concept has been abused by people in the past who think it's an all purpose defeater for anything that looks evolutionary, and it's not. Could you also explain the uh, the uh, notion of uh, irreducible complexity in sure. organisms, please? Sure. Um, irreducible complexity is a concept that um, was coined by Michael Behe in a book called Darwin's Black Box that's sold 300,000 copies in print. It's amazing for a science book. The idea is that um, complex functions like the one performed by this laser pointer require multiple independent components, all of which must be jointly present at the same moment in time for that function, but none of which is individually sufficient. So in Michael's examples, he looks at things like the bacterial flagellum. Uh, in your large intestine right now, there are trillions of E. coli happily munching away. You need them for normal digestion. And they have flagellar motors embedded in their cell wall that have multiple components, none of which is individually sufficient to provide that function. They're all required, and they're all required at the same moment in time. And the, ir the complexity is irreducible because you have this lower threshold of parts, and if you drop below that, you lose the function that you need. So in that book, he looks at a multiple, multiple examples Blood clotting is one, there are others. Uh, and it's, that book actually has generated a huge literature. Again, this is where you can make a career. You want to critique Michael Behe, the doors of the journals will be open to you. It's a great idea. It's been very fruitful for generating discussion. Um, this is slightly more personal, and I don't want to like reduce you to your faith, um, but I know Christians tend to, you know, the, the point is the faith. The point isn't justification through science. Um, just out of curiosity, from your perspective, if you were to find evidence of God and God just appeared in his concrete fact, how would that affect your faith? Like if God showed up at my door on, yeah. on Monday morning? I mean, um, <clears throat> I suppose, what's the difference in your mind? Um, or, yeah, how would that affect your faith if it was no longer faith, if it was based on actual concrete evidence? That's a really, really hard question. Um, well, here's a, here's a puzzle that's always bothered me. Uh, if you look at the accounts in the New Testament of Jesus' miracles, um, the Pharisees, who didn't believe he was the Son of God, they thought he was a bad guy indeed, they saw many of the miracles. You could not ask for better sense data. Right in front of them, he healed people. Right in front of them, he, he did remarkable things. So they had first-hand, you know, direct observational access to these events that are recounted in the Gospels. Yet, yet they said, you know, he casts out, casts out demons by Beelzebub. It's an illogical explanation, but they were able to explain away what they saw, which means that the sense data come in, Eyes, ears, you know, they're, they're taking in the information. Somewhere between the data and the conclusion, there's a disconnect. So the nature of faith is really puzzling because you could have the very best kind of evidence you could want. I mean, God could walk in here 
and kind of scary. But God walks in. He says, you know what? I'm going to make a really cool, I'm going to make a panda right here. Bam, <laughs> panda. And probably a significant fraction of this audience would say, mm, I haven't, you know, there was something in that food tonight. This is a world-class hallucination, but I do not have reliable evidence of God. You can always change your standard. So the question you ask is really hard to answer because it touches on the mystery of what it is to have faith. Does faith rest on evidence, or is there an, another part of it that is not strictly evidential? So I frankly don't know how to answer that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm as certain as I am of my own name that, that God exists and, and loves me, but frankly, if God showed up, the first thing I would do is would be terrified. But I'm not sure that it would have that persuasive power for, for, for you know, People don't respond uniformly to evidence. It's a real mystery of what's going on there. It's kind of like the Cartesian, you know, the demon and whatnot. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I'm interested in that rule you had from the National... National Academy? Yeah. Um, so you keep saying that it's holding back science and, like, it's constraining us. Are there any past examples where... Okay, someone didn't have that rule, and they discovered something because of because they were free to think that way. And if you could speculate wildly, what do you think would happen um, if this rule was gone? Um, first, first part of your question. Uh, yeah, I would say that um, that much of Newton's work. Uh, was predicated on his belief that there was a supreme intelligence that built, for instance, the solar system. And that the peculiar features of our solar system, for instance, the fact that the planets all occur in a very narrow plane, w with comets coming in on rather eccentric orbits, but the, the, the whole system having this kind of functional integrity that Newton said could really only be explained by intelligence. So if you look at the Principia, his masterpiece, and in particular at the General Scolium, he says, let's see if I can get an exact quote, this most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only have proceeded from the, from the wise uh, something something of a, of a mind. You know, that's a fairly close paraphrase. Now, let's go back to 1700 when he's putting the Principia together, and Make him follow this. What's going to happen to his thinking at that point? Well, it's going to be constrained. The, the, the version that you have here in the Ohio State Library of Newton's masterpiece has the general scolium. It is a fact of scientific history that he thought about universal gravitation and so forth within a theistic framework and explicitly explained it within a theistic framework by reference to an intelligent cause. So as we come towards the present, what happens is the toolkit of science actually gets smaller in the middle of the 19th century. In the Darwinian revolution, I think this is in fact its most fundamental achievement, is to put this rule in place in a way that I think constrains, constrains discovery. So that's one example. There are others that I could mention, but it's one that I find most striking. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the second. Oh, what would happen? Nothing. Because science works by competition. And let's suppose I get a paper into print arguing that the ribosome is intelligently caused. That becomes a high profile target for literally thousands of qualified critics. They have it in their crosshairs. In fact, what happened with Mike Behe's book is that uh, Richard Lenski at Michigan State uh, uh, well, it's a long list of critics started to critique the paper in scientific, oh, excuse me, critique the idea in scientific journals. And what happened was the ordinary process of testing and refutation. So you suspend the rule, and what happens is normal human reason takes over and science goes on its way. We just have more options, but they will be tested and critiqued just like every other idea. The problem now is that if I wanted to get a paper into print about the ribosome, I would have to leave it as an unsolved problem. 
I would have to say something like the origin of the ribosome is a puzzle for evolution. And I, I wouldn't be able to take the next step and say I think it points to intelligent design. But I think of science as in, incredibly competitive and it's, it's, a, it's a, a battle of ideas and may the best idea win. And I just want to get rid of a rule that I think, you know, slowing the game down. <laughs> right, so, but like if this rule wasn't here, you know, would the only difference be that, okay, our unsolved problems now become, well, it was intelligently designed no. and that's it, or do you think? No, because that would be a mistake. That would be a God of the Gaps move. Um, and it would be a disaster if people took intelligence and started jamming it into every open puzzle they could find because it happened to be an easy solution. Um, I think that what, what you would need to do is have testability and a design hypothesis for any particular biological structure need, would need to be provided in such a way that it made testable predictions. Uh, because I take testability as the main criterion for science. You have to figure out, you have to know, if you made a mistake, how you could discover that. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think, I, I mean, it w what, what you describe would be a disaster, because it would absolutely jam the wheels. It would jam the gears. And um, that's not the kind of intelligent design science that I would like to see. Thank you. Yeah. had a comment to that that ID critics tend to say that that's what will happen that people will jam ID into all the gaps or that curiosity will just disappear because everybody can say God did it that's a sociological observation not a philosophical one or it could be both but the fact is it hasn't happened and they're making an empirically false observation when they say that that's what's likely to happen. I agree with you. And it, it hasn't happened, and it didn't happen. It, you know, if you look at the history of science in the West from, let's say, the late medieval period to the present, intelligent design was a live option that whole period, really until about the middle of the 19th century. And, you know, Darwin himself set sail on the Beagle as a creationist. So... Uh, if, if a more open philosophy of science was conducive to Darwin and, and the work that he did, it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't scare anybody for us to go back there. I mean, I'll, I'll use a different metaphor. It really bothers me when someone uses a ladder and then pulls it up after themselves. It was okay for me, but now I'm up on the roof. You have to figure out your own way to get out here. I want all the options that Darwin had as a young man. You presented uh, two um, ways of solving puzzles. Yeah. One is a naturalistic way that you sort of characterize as physics involved. Yeah. Not only the science of physics, but also chemistry. And the other is a way that involves intelligence. Um, so I'm curious about the, uh, the physics um, way of solving puzzles. Uh, if, you, if you look at physics and chemistry, uh, there's a lot of complexity involved in the things that they study. Um, you could spend the rest of your life studying physics or chemistry, uh, exploring the regularities that you see there. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if those things, the incredible regularities uh, that you see, the, the physical uh, laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, yeah. if you think those things um, uh, warrant some sort of a intelligent explanation. Um. I think that uh, if you take the universe in its totality, it is itself a contingent object. It's, it, it, did not, it did not arise by any kind of necessity. And this is my own philosophical conviction. So there are design theorists uh, who are physicists who would say that the fine tuning of the physical constants uh, indicates a choice from a range of possible outcomes. 
electing a particular set of outcomes to make chemistry possible, to make biochemistry possible, to make the formation of this planet possible. And they would see the picking of certain choices in terms of, for instance, the, as I said, the, the constants uh, as indicating an intellect operating. Now, I myself am not comfortable with that, not because it's not true or it could not be argued for, but because I don't know enough physics. And I try to stay away from commenting on sciences where I have not put in a lot of study. So I'm sorry, but I, you know, I don't want to get myself in a jam talking about physics, especially at the level of cosmology, which is where your question would apply, when I don't really feel comfortable with the relevant science. I'm bracketing physics and chemistry uh, in the sense of saying these are, these are causal processes that are very powerful and very regular. Um, you know, we all know what's going to happen to this object with mass if I let it go. You know, I won't because I've tried to do this before to illustrate a point. <laughs> it didn't get my hand underneath it. This is a $60 laser pointer. I won't let it go, but we know what would happen with a probability approaching one. It's going to head towards the center of this gravitational field. You look at those kinds of regularities and you say, can they generate the incompressible information in a single protein sequence or a single gene? So if you're going to build life bottom up using physics and chemistry, they have to be able to provide the information necessary to build a cell. And that information to me looks incompressible in the sense that if you want that protein, you're going to need the gene that codes for it, and that particular base sequence of DNA cannot be generated by any algorithm. To have that sequence, you need the sequence. In that sense, it's incompressible. An algorithm will not generate it for you. There's no shorter description that will provide that information. So if there are these discontinuities in the history of life on this planet, that seem to require information dense events and sources. I want science to be free to infer that and not have to obey a rule that wasn't always the case in science. It's very much historically a change, like a change in a, in a sport. You know, science woke up one day and said, we're not going to allow inferences to non-human intelligence anymore, even though it could have happened. It's off. It's off the table. Uh, would you say that you um, embrace all aspects of microevolution, micro but you kind of have more of a problem than macro? Is there a division there? Or I, I'll embrace any evolution for which there is really good evidence, or even just good evidence. So for microevolutionary processes, um, you know, I gave the example in the, my talk of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. That happens, and it's scary that it happens, and it's real, and it's caused in part by natural selection. Um, and my problem with macroevolutionary hypotheses is the kinds of changes that you would require for that to happen, at least by natural selection, appear not to occur. Uh, so to show me. Show me the data, you know, I'll consider it. But I think microevolutionary uh, evidence is well supplied. We see it all the time. What we don't see are macroevolutionary events. And it's very hard to see how they would work given the logic of natural selection. And then my own question, uh, this issue of chance. I run this on campus a lot. Because, you know, you're talking about intelligent design theory. Some people are saying nature and chance can account for the complexity of life. Would you, how would you define chance? Is it misunderstood that word? Is it a cause? I mean, what? Do you think, people, do you think people understand the word chance? No, I don't. That? And I think chance. Can you, can you clear that up just real quickly? Well, the problem is chance is, a, is often a placeholder for what we don't know. Um, uh, I think that, that certain toy models will let you describe it, like lotteries, roulette wheels, card shuffling, you know, you can, you can describe certain kinds of outcomes with respect to a probability distribution and some causal process that's operating. But in these kinds of questions, chance is often a placeholder for ignorance. It's some physical process uh, 
with a, you know a range of possible outcomes that we don't really understand. And the the challenge philosophically, at least from a theistic perspective, is it's hard to see how there is any real chance in the universe. You asked you know you asked me to go there, so you know no, that you know it's a big problem. Yeah, I just I just think a lot of people like you said seem to be in ignorance of the gaps there. You say right. you plug God in it, we plug chance in it, and then we argue which is the chance. 